Hey guys, and welcome to one more episode of Builder Nation. For today's agenda, we have Professor Roland Sigward. He's a professor of autonomous systems at ETH since 2006 and co-director of the research since 2015. He is also co-founder of multiple successful spin-off companies in robotics and a board member of many Swiss institutions. So welcome, Professor. Super happy to have you here. I'm glad that I think I could pronounce your name correctly. <laughs> welcome Perfect. to the view. Yes, it's a very great pleasure and honor to be here. And I hope I can give you some, some thoughts uh, of my long career in robotics. So I'm a professor in robotics at ETH Zurich. Uh, I was before a professor in robotics, mainly autonomous systems also in, at EPFL Lausanne, the Auto Institute in Switzerland, Technology University. And I was at different other places uh, for as postdoc uh, at Stanford and with spin-off companies. Wow, amazing. So you're an expert basically in robotics. And I wanted to ask you, what was your first approach with robots? Like when do you, at some point of your life, maybe in your childhood, do you have any memory that it's related to the topic? Yeah, interestingly, a friend of mine have had a memory. He told me that I always spoke about robots when I was about 10, that I will once become an inventor of robots. I didn't remember, remember this. And of course, then I really got into robotics and related fields because I have studied during this evolution of, of personal computers. When I started with my studies, we had still these cards for programming computers. And at the end of my studies, we had laptops, small laptops, uh, which of course were not very powerful. And this made me really excited about using this combination because I studied mechanical engineering, the combination between computers, sensors, and mechanical engineering. And robots, I think this is the, the most uh, interesting fields to apply this different engineering disciplines. Totally, and yeah, I noticed that, that you went to school, university uh, for mechanical engineering, and then you jumped directly for your PhD in mechatronics. Did you feel like a, a big transition there or was it just, like the standard, the standard method? No, it probably was a big transition because it uh, was pretty new. I think most mechanical engineers, we started still by drawing on, on paper and making the designs of, of machines. And, uh, but I had the chance that there was a lot of movement in this field. And so all of a sudden I thought, this is uh, what, I, what I want to combine the different elements. And this was an, also my PhD thesis, which was not in robotics, but very related in mechatronics where we use computers to control active magnetic bearings, which are actually rotors, which are suspended in magnetic fields without co contact. And this uh, was uh, very exciting for me. Um, uh, and uh, this was then driving happily me forward and I had a lot of opportunity to then really move more and more deeply in robotics. And do you remember what was the first robot you ever built and what was the project for? So the, the first robots, I was not the main investigator, but what I was involved was actually a robot playing ping pong. Um, and this is actually also strongly linked with, I was there with the Institute of Mechanics where we did more and more mechatronics. And so of course mechanics is, uh, and dynamics is moving parts and you want to be fast and dynamic. And then we thought, what, what could we probably build a robot which can actually beat a human by playing ping pong against a human. And so it was a very fast uh, mechanics, but then we realized that we also have to, to catch the ball or actually see how the ball uh, yeah. moves. You need a lot of modeling and then you need uh, vision. At this time, the computer system was about 150,000 uh, Swiss francs or dollars um, only for this uh, ping pong playing, um, which today you have the same co uh, calculation power in a, in a smartphone. And you could easily do this, what we did there with this very expensive computers. Wow, it sounds, I mean, I, I will never imagine that your first robot was something so complex. It may sound like a, for entertainment, you know, like a robot in order to, to play a game. But at the end of the day, I mean, just like you're saying, you have to calculate everything, you know, step by step in order to the robot to receive the ball and stuff like that. 
And I did a little research on your investigation and I noticed that you're a passionate for flying robots. So how was the transition from building a robot in order to play ping pong to actually one that it can fly? Yeah, actually, this was uh, quite some time later. In between, I also started to use really robots for education. I think it's a wonderful tool for students. So this was in 92 where we did the first robot competition with students at ETH. And then I continued with this in, uh, when I moved to Lausanne. And in Lausanne, we, um, Lausanne was at the time when I started as a professor in, in uh, 96, 7. Um, it was known as robotics, but small robots. And so we started also to build small robots, small robots with wheels, which were the size of a sugar cube, um, which uh, were propulsed with wheels, with, uh, where the motors were from watches. And then um, this was really fascinating. And we did also some, some first of uh, uh, swarm behavior of these robots. But then I rea we realized that these small robots are extremely limited. They can only move on flat ground. And then we said, could we probably build some propellers and make them fly? And this is actually where we, we started to, to do flying robots. So it was first really a very small robot about this size with two propellers, which were uh, much bigger than the robot, um, to, with the idea to jump over ob objects. And then uh, we realized that now time is good. And so we started to build this uh, quadrator robot, uh, flying platforms, which was the idea was not new, but it was never actually flying fully autonomously or uh, fully stably um, by itself. Typically they had some, some preliminary tests on the gimbals and we were, because the time was good, the, this inertial management units were available, still more expensive than today, and the motors were available. So we were able in uh, around 2003, 2004 to show that you can fly with the quadrotor. Um, and I think this uh, initiated a, a big uh, new uh, movement in research, but then also uh, later on by commercializing this, uh, where today we have uh, millions of of these drones, which are sold every year. Wow. Wow, this is really interesting. I mean, and since you have so many years of experience in the field, what would you say that it's the biggest misconception in the field of robotics, like in the, let's say in the last 10 years? I don't know if they're a big misconception, but I think it's extremely important that you always really go also in a real field or real applications. You can. Um, uh, do a lot of uh, fancy robots moving simulations, but once you have to deal with the real world, changing lightning conditions, changing situations, surprising situations, there the challenge begins. And you have to deploy. And we had all the research I did with my collaborators was always that we were then moving on a real robot and doing experiments in the real world. Sometimes it's hard, it's, uh, sometimes it's tiring, but once it works, or at least uh, partially works, it's probably much more inspiring and rewarding uh, because you can really see your little baby mechanical robot uh, with sensors and computers to evolve in our daily environment. Totally. And I mean, you mentioned that it took you three years, you and your team in order to develop this ping pong robot, right? So what would you say in all of your years of experience that it has been your biggest, the biggest technical challenge that you have ever solved? That's uh, probably a very difficult question. <laughs> but, or um, one experience that you can share with us. Yeah, so I, I think we, we had a lot of, of challenges, <clears throat> but this is actually what you like at universities. And very often these challenges came because we were actually, for example, flying. We did, for example, also in parallel, not only flying robots, but bigger delivery robot type of, of systems in research. So we had navigation, um, localization, mapping and everything. And we were very proud that we were able to solve and have uh, robots uh, moving around uh, fully autonomously. But now we have all of a sudden these flying platforms. And then the uh, question is, how can you now do this on the flying platform? We, has, you, we have very limited uh, calculation power. You have limited payload, so you cannot put whatever sensors. Also, the sensors have to be where. And I think this was a, one of the big challenge, which actually let us move in new fields. With ground robots, first we used mainly lasers, which were also at this time very new, but very exciting because you had very high quality measurement for localization and mapping. But then on flying platform, this was not possible. So we had to move to, to its vision. 
And uh, then we tried to do the same thing with vision, only with cameras. And uh, this was one of the challenges. So, and as I think it's still a challenge to have a flying platform flying in, in the woods or flying in very complex indoor settings, um, uh, avoiding collisions because you are still have limited calculation power, you have limited views. Um, so that's one of the challenges. This is also the reason why we did after, always we continued with de de developing new platforms, but we did a lot, or this was typically the main research we did is, is in navigation, meaning mapping, localization, and also pass planning for robots um, with all this challenging environment you encounter with uh, flying, but also walking and, and wheeled robots. Wow, really interesting. And is it really dangerous? You know, like you mentioned how it's more complex to build flying robots for indoors. Do you think it's dangerous or more dangerous than having robots flying outside? Yes, absolutely. So indoor, it's, it's much dangerous as, as soon as you're sharing the environment with humans. Um, it's also noisy. Um, we always tried in our research to stay away for the very dangerous stuff uh, by just doing small robots. So we okay. pushed also with drones, very small robots, because they are not really dangerous for humans. As soon as you have uh, 10, 20 kilograms robots, the propellers can really, in worst case, even kill a person. You have to be much more uh, serious about all the safety issues. But with the small platforms, it, it, uh, if you wear gloves and the protection for your head, I think there is it's a little You're danger. Fine. <laughs> yes. And this is why we pushed on one side, we have project to make it even smaller, and then we got more and more excited about having longer flight times because the small rotary uh, wing drone, so with this uh, four propellers or sometimes they have six or eight propellers, they have very limited flight time by, because helicopter flight is by itself physically not very efficient. So we thought then, can we actually combine this with, with fixed wing or how far can we go with fixed wing? which was then the next challenge where we showed that we can actually fly with solar powered fixed wing airplanes with even small ones, uh, more than 24 hours. So we flew a couple days, day and night by charging the batteries and using the sun as a, the power source. Okay, and I wanted to ask you the, the other day that I was doing you know, the research on the topic, I, I wanted to ask you about robot simulation. Like how, can you explain a little bit about the transfer from the actual sim simulation to the real system? Like, how does it work? Yeah, so I'm, uh, as mentioned, I'm a mechanical engineer. I strongly believe that modeling is, is very important because modeling allows you to somewhat predict how a system will behave. And this is especially important for robotics. So if you, and this gives you also some feedback before you build it on the design. So you design a robot. So this is, probably less of an issue with wheel robots, but as soon as you have flying robots also, or especially also walking robots, you have to have a model so that you can actually optimize, you can know if the motors you are designing in are strong enough to really do the movement and fast enough to, to do the movement. And today, actually, the modeling is even more important because um, more and more of the systems will learn some of their controllers, so they, how to, to move faster, how to do the uh, best locomotion. And this you can typically not train on the robot itself because you have only one robot very often in research labs. And it would take years to train the robot in different train to learn how to walk. But now you, if you have a good model, you can actually train in simulation. You actually can imitate in the simulation whatever environment. You can have 100, 1,000, 100,000 robots in parallel learning and so you can get much better. And this is, for example, something which um, initiated the, the whole walking robot in my lab, but now it's uh, one of my former PhDs on Michael Hutter, which does an outstanding star, uh, job. And he was able to show that his robots, they can learn how to walk and can walk much better than if you do only what you did in the past, more or less trying to have a controller which does uh, good locomotion. Wow. I'm learning so much about robotics in like three minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Something else that I wanted to ask you is like, since you have such a background in entrepreneurship and in the field, like what would you think that nowadays it's so hard for robotic startups to, to success? What do you think it will be the main key in order for them to, to grow, to 
actually get their robots into the market maybe in the future i don't know any thoughts about this yeah i think it's it's probably very simple um if you start at university you are dreaming of the perfect robot which is probably capable to do whatever we human can and i think it's good if researchers really have this dream and try to put, put, make one step after the other two with this goal but a startup should forget about this dream and should really say what can we do today and what can we solve with what we can do today and i think there have been in the last 10 years I think the biggest, the fastest of all we feel in, in robotics was flying platforms. There is now millions per year sold for private use, but for professional use. Now, why is this uh, possible? In principle, flying is for us seems not so easy, but this control stuff we have, we can do since quite a while. But now once you are in the air, the navigation is much easier in the, the free space because you have no collision risks, no, so you trust in the free space and you have GPS, which tells you always where you are. As soon as you're in the building, it's more difficult. And you can see that today you can buy small drones, you can fly outside, take images, but you cannot buy drones which really fly into your home and uh, do something in, in the home because they have no GPS, then you have to rely on, on vision. Basically, the technology is today ready, but it will take some time to really bring it on, on the drones. So I think it's important to, at one point, once you do research, you should go for the crazy dreams. Once you're going for the uh, company, you should actually really step down and say, what can I do which can be useful and which I can sell, which is the te technology today? Nice, really interesting question. And, and there are so many research questions still open. I, I always say that it may, it may, uh, amazingly, um, a lot of stuff which we think is, is not very difficult is extremely difficult for robots. I always say cleaning a kitchen after mm -hmm. you have probably some friends, you have a big mess in your kitchen. Cleaning up a kitchen, people, even kids, uh, once they go to school, they can help you on this. Robots will will still have a lot of struggles also in 20 years down the road, I'm sure. Because we are very good in, in a tactile and interaction. We have all these haptics, um, which we are extremely good. So there is not only the intelligence, which uh, has some uh, really good progress, perception and so on, but you have to also have other interaction means. And this is even more difficult. Our hands, our fingers are wonderful tools. And if you look, at the today's hands of robots, they're extremely clumsy. Sometimes they look like human hands, but they are so far from what we can do with our hands. We can actually feel the touches. We have immediately a feel how we can grab an object. This is extremely difficult. So do you think that the future in robotics is relying on probably education or that kind of field instead of like doing everyday chores in order to solve our everyday tasks? Yeah, I think the, the applications is, is pretty broad. And, and I think it's it also the society which has to think about what, what is the best application. I'm personally all, mainly interested in all these applications where today humans are doing work, which is probably not healthy for them. Typical example is mining. There is people 2,000 meters underground working there every day. Um, in an environment which is uh, 50 degrees Celsius, it's extremely hot, it's very bad air. So at one point, we should not send humans down there. We should have robots doing these jobs. Or also in agriculture, sometimes people have to work on the direct sun exposure in very different uh, environment. We should have robots there. I think we should first think of robots. I, I'm not dreaming of the robot at home. I think I can clean up my, kit and my kitchen but I'm dreaming of robots which actually help to save lives of people or probably also to, to get rid of this abuse of people. Because if you are working in this very harsh environment, typically your life expectancy is much, much lower. And I think we, we should um, uh, to use technology for, for getting a relief for all these people. And you know what, something that I, I have noticed in, the, in, you know, like doing research about this industry is how human robotics can be, you know, experts on the topic. I, I have talked with so many during this, this podcast 
And I found out, you know, once that you are like really deep into the topic, you realize how, how humans need more help in order to solve like bigger necessities instead of like everyday tasks, you know? So I love how human robotics can be, you know? It sounds really weird and maybe funny at the same time, but it's, I mean, it's life-changing, I think. Yeah, so I think this is also the fascination of our robotics. So I, 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 of course, you can imagine I love robotics because it's, it covers all the different disciplines, but it goes beyond engineering discipline. It's also about ethics, about uh, human-machine interaction, how, uh, at one point, we will automatically fall back to the question how humans work and how humans do something. It has a lot of links. Of course, uh, robots are also very often used to understand more about humans, about human co cognition. So I think it's extremely broad. And of course, it's still a bit this dream that you, you make a copy of the humans. We are extremely far from, from doing this. But this dream uh, gives a lot of uh, connections to humans or the nature and, and animals and let us learn about this, get an inspi inspiration on this, but also uh, let us understand better why dogs are, be are designed like this or evolved like this so that they can run fast, for example. And what do you think about like, giving the robots the ability to take decisions instead of humans? Do you agree with this? Do you not agree with this? In principle, there is not a black white stuff. And so in principle, every autonomous robot is taking some sort of a decision because uh, so they will decide uh, to go left or right because there is an obstacle on the left and we want these robots to take decisions. I think um, this is probably more a question also with AI in general. I think uh, AI can help us to humans to take better decisions and so it's uh, i think it's not the robots which uh, and uh, computers should take the final decision on complex situation and tasks like we in in a war i think it's people which should be behind but also in in a lot of, a lot of other fields but these machines can help us to get better decisions because they are much better in collecting information for example analyzing information um, and deep learning and learning in general can help us to get better information for deciding about what treatment a human needs, what uh, next step you should do, where is probably the risk of avalanches. We are, for example, having projects like this, where the drones are inspecting the environment and taking images and analyzing where is probably a risk of an avalanche, and then we can protect people. But the finalization with where we should probably say now people are not allowed to go there anymore. This will, I think, continue to be a, a human. Nice. And now that we're talking about the future and how important robots are, where do you see the future on the, on the medical side? Do you see any future there or any improvement in that area? Yes, I think in general, uh, robots in the medical field, first of all, for, for intervention, it's, it's already well established. And it's somewhat a tool. And there, of course, all the decisions are taken by the, the medical doctors, but it helps the medical doctor be much more precise. Also our hands, we cannot hold something very strongly and precisely. These robots can do a much better job. And I think this will further evolve so that we have um, less uh, impact on the human body. So we do, there's a lot of these minimal invasive uh, interventions, which are done by if it's Da Vinci and other robots, then of course the robots can also help on the other side for rehabilitation so that the robot, people can much faster get back to normal life. And I think in, in general, medicine should mainly have in, in view that we should people bring back people to a normal life. It's not about giving the, the person at the end of the life two more months. This is probably not worse, but we have to have people back on normal life and, and happy life as soon as possible. And robots can help in rehabilitation, but sometimes they can also support, they can support elderly people in staying at home for longer, which is also important. And I have, for example, always a dream, we have been involved also in a lot of autonomous driving uh, research. And then people ask me, when will this be ready? And I was always opposing Elon Musk because I, since 15 years or um, I'm always saying that 
this will probably be the moment when I'm turning 80, which is still another 15 to 20 years. Uh, but then I hope when I'm not allowed to drive anymore, or probably my vision is not so good anymore to drive, then autonomous uh, robots will, will drive me to my kids or grandkids so that I can still be in my full life. Of course, autonomous robots can do already today a lot of good jobs, also autonomous cars, but until they can cover all situations, imagine a snowstorm in Switzerland or even snow on the street, none of our autonomous driving systems which I know uh, can handle snow. Snow, because then you have, you don't see the street anymore. We humans are extremely good in, in uh, understanding the situations. Okay. Yeah, so it probably will take a lot of years <laughs> still, but I think it, I mean, it sounds like a, like a really hard work in order to make a machine understand everyday life situations. So yeah, uh, I believe you that it will take a lot of years yeah. from now on. Yeah, exactly. And of course, there is more and more that the, the, the robots learn by themselves, that you don't program them, but they have to make this experience. Now, this comes also back a little bit with simulation. You can speed up the experience in simulation, but simulation has still somewhat is not the real world. And the robots have to learn during their execution in the real world. And of course, you will not release robots in our daily environment if they are still dangerous. So the question is, how mature should they be so that you can release it? And how can they, then they learn to get even better, but not get worse? Because then all of a sudden they're dangerous again. So there is a lot of, of these issues which we still have to, to understand how we can tackle this. And, um, and I think there is also still a lot of understanding on how we humans can, with our brain, uh, solve so diverse situation and learn extremely fast. Um, we we very, are very often we see something once in our life and we learn it. We un immediately understand. I will say that uh, if you so show a, a giraffe to a kid, even in on a drawing, and the next day day or a week later you go to the zoo, the kids will say, "Oh, this is a giraffe." Mm -hmm. I have seen one image of a giraffe. Computers are at the moment not capable to do this because we have another way of understanding, which I think is also linked with our living because we are not only understanding because we are looking at something, but we are living in this environment and this has a meaning for us in our really direct uh, life. So experience is a key point in order to, in order for the robots to keep improving. That's what you're saying. Yes, absolutely. We have to they live have to, through it. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And also, I think it's a, a matter of humans changing their perspective about robots, because if we do not allow them in our everyday life, and if we do not at some point get used to having them, you know, close to, to us, then how, how are the robots going to leave the experience, you know? Yeah, but I'm not so worried about this because humans are pretty fast in accepting. So we, we are accepting every day a lot of new technology. Imagine so smartphones, there is uh, 20 years ago there, nobody was thinking that everybody has a smartphone and is uh, always in connection. So we just live with it. I'm uh, pretty sure that it will be the same as robots once they do a good job in our daily environment. So people will, will get used to it and, and actually we'll see that they hopefully can benefit from, from these robots uh, so that they probably can avoid uh, very difficult and dangerous tasks. Hopefully, I'm pretty sure that they will be beneficial for us. <laughs> um, Professor, do you have any last advice? Yeah, I think in general, um, robotics is a wonderful field, but in general, I think young people especially, they should um, dream of some stuff and then they should, should select the most complex thing where they're afraid and they think, I probably will never do it. You should exactly go for this because then you will be excited, you will make progress. It, it's probably more tough than you think, but um, I think you should always go for the, the big challenges. And robotics has a lot of uh, wonderful challenges, uh, a lot of different fields where you can learn and, and grow and hopefully make a lot of uh, progress for society in uh, also the context of um, uh, climate change and uh, all these issues. We will run uh, at limits of uh, feeding the whole world, world population. And I think technology robots will help us hopefully to be much more efficient on the field, but also less 
have a negative impact in the field. For example, not spraying the, the, the fields with chemistry and pesticide, but just rather go very precisely with robots and interfere where it is needed. Wow, definitely. It's up to us to make a difference and yes. to, for the young generations to get interested in the topic. So thank you so much, Professor, for taking the time and being here. Do you have any social media handles? Where can people find you? Yeah, no, not so extreme. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, typically, you can find me with my name. You can. I'm on Twitter a little bit, uh, also with my name. I'm on Facebook, uh, I have uh, even Instagram, but I'm not really very active on active. Instagram. Okay, so LinkedIn probably is the best way to go. Yeah, LinkedIn and uh, this is perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for being here, for taking the time. Guys, remember that you can also find more information and interesting articles and interviews like this one with the professor in our website, controlhub slash builder dash nation. We will be super happy to have you there. And once again, thank you, professor. It was, it was our pleasure. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure for me.